Honorable Chancellor of Goa University, Mr. Bharatveer Vanchu, a friend and colleague of mine for several years, esteemed Vice Chancellor of Goa University, Dr. Satish Shetty, Dr. V.P. Kamath, Registrar of Goa University, and I recognize in the audience several very distinguished personalities, most of whom were my colleagues years ago, General Rodericks, General Arun, I'm sorry, Admiral Arun Prakash, Admiral Suresh Mehta, and if Mr. Dodo Filori will remember me from the days when we were on the same side on many matters, Mr. Dodo Filorio and many other very, very outstanding people who are present here today. At the outset, I would like to say, and I'm not, not responsible of, for what was said about me. I think maybe, maybe Bharat was responsible for that, but I disown a lot of that as my expertise in various fields and what I did, et cetera, et cetera. But I must say that I do deem it a great privilege to have been invited to deliver the inaugural lecture in the Prashottam Kakodka lecture series of Goa University instituted by the University Grants Commission. <coughs> I did not know at that time that Prashottam Kakodka was the father of my very dear friend, Anil Kakodka. Once again, there's a case of an intelligence failure. <laughs> Anil Kakodka and I, I think, worked very closely from 2005 to 2009. And a couple of years ago, when I was invited to speak on the occasion of the award of the Goa Bibushan, I think the Goa Bibushan to Anil Kakotka, uh, I paid him a debt of gratitude for what he had done as far as the India-US Civil Nuclear Initiative was concerned, in which we worked very closely together. So today, I have an opportunity to pay my homage to his very revered and distinguished father, Mr. Purshottam Kakotka, about whom you've just heard from the esteemed Vice Chancellor. I had heard about Mr. Purshottam Kakotka. I had known that he was an icon as far as those responsible for the freedom struggle and for those who helped gain for us our independence. I was also aware that he was singled out by the Portuguese administration, particularly the Salazar administration, and was deported for more than 10 years, etc. But I think Goa has several outstanding personalities of this kind. And I'm therefore particularly grateful and privileged to have an opportunity to speak at the lecture which is instituted in his name. I also would like to here commend Goa University, a relatively young university as universities go, I think a little over 25 years. But I'm aware, having worked in the Prime Minister's office and having been in the system for long, that it has established a name for itself, itself for high quality research, particularly in the area of ocean studies and technology. At a time when we are all talking of declining university standards, the fact that an university is a center of excellence in a particular or a specialized field is certainly therefore a matter for which all members of the Goa University, in particular the Vice Chancellor, the Registrar and others, and of course the Ch Chancellor can take pride. <coughs> For this inaugural talk in the UGC-sponsored lecture series, I have chosen a topic which may look a little out of place. But I find that in recent years, the subject of Asia and India has become very current across the world, in the council of the world, whether in the academic area or otherwise. I think exactly a month ago in Harvard, I had an occasion to speak on on Asia as part of the Asia Vision Series. 
And I realized how much attention is now being placed and put on the, on, onto Asia. And hence, when the Vice Chancellor asked me what I would like to speak on, I chose this, this topic. The subject, as the Vice Chancellor mentioned, is India and the evolving Asian dynamics. The topic, as I said, is highly relevant. For in contemporary times, not, we have not seen any part of the world have the same kind of global attention as the one that is now focused on Asia and India. Recent years have witnessed great changes across the globe, no doubt, and there have been many power shifts on a scale and, a, and on a speed rarely seen previously. But nowhere is this more evident in Asia. While China's growth over the past two decades and more, and to a lesser extent that of India's, has received a great deal of public attention, little heralded are the other changes that have been taking place across the entire Asian region. Somehow, these have been dwarfed by the presence of these two larger Asian countries. Such changes have involved not only their economies and their economic performance, which are undergoing a, ma a major transformation, but also their strategic outlook. Singapore and Japan have been models for long and have been em attempted emulation by other Asian countries. To this should now be added Taiwan, Indonesia, South Korea, Vietnam, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Thailand et al. Countries emerging from years of isolation like Myanmar or those shackled by insurgency and terrorism like Afghanistan also hold out considerable promise for the future. It is hence important for us in India to properly comprehend the nature of the changes that are taking place in our neighborhood. And that's what I propose to do in my lecture today. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two Asias. There is an economic Asia and there is a political Asia, both competing for space and attention. Let me first talk of the Asian economies, the economic Asia, so to say. Economically, we have a dynamic and to a considerable extent integrated Asia, with 53% of its trade now being conducted within the region itself and the US dollar 19 trillion economy that has become an engine of global growth. The Asian Development Bank anticipates that by 2050, Asia would nearly double its share of the global GDP to, to 52%. Engaging with Asia economically has therefore become a key imperative for countries across the globe. It is driven by the fact that Asian economies demonstrate extraordinary dynamism, and Asian markets have become critical to resuscitate the world economy. <clears throat> also, at a time of exponentially accelerating change, Asia and Asian economics and economies are providing an impetus for new paradigms of thought, action, and behavior. With the economies of various Asian countries poised for growth, pressures on them to integrate their economies have become very intense. This is already beginning to take place. A network of regional and pluralist groupings is already in, in place. Most are confined to economic-related issues, but some also incorporate political and, eco and security aspects. I shall here refer to a few of them, which I think are making a great impact. I think I would start with the Association for Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, as it's probably known, which is the largest of these groupings and the oldest, and dates back to 1967. It is also possibly the most successful of any regional grouping outside Europe. Next, we have the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, comprising countries of South Asia, which was set up in 1985, but remained dormant for several years, but lately has shown a great deal of vigor and dynamism, 
moving from a largely declaratory to an implementation phase. India, as is well known, is the largest country and the largest economy in SARC. And it has deliberately chosen to adopt a, an asymmetrical and non-reciprocal approach towards the association's other nation members to ensure forward movement. We also have the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar group, better known by its acronym BCIM, which incorporates the strategically located sub-regional areas of the four countries. We have BIMSTEC, comprising Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Bhutan, and Nepal. In West Asia, we have a Gulf Cooperation Council to help coordinate mainly oil and economic aspects, but also to some extent political matters. We have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in which China and Russia play a leading part and which include several Central Asian and East Asian countries and in which we have an observer status. In Central Asia, an experiment with an Eurasian Union formed originally by Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, which is now trying to include other Central Asian countries is, in, is becoming active. Over and above these groups, there are several other mechanisms in place which are not solely limited to Asia or to economic issues, but have Asian participation, mainly, um, the participation being mainly from India. These are IPSA, India, Brazil, South Africa, BRICS, that is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and three, India, the India-Africa Forum. Forum Summit, which links India and Asia with Africa. Notwithstanding these groupings and current Asian dynamics, it is a concurrent rise of China and India which represents a geopolitical event of historic proportions. Rarely has the world witnessed the simultaneous rise of two large populous nations, both possessing ancient and venerable cultures, and living in such close proximity to one another. The global system has yet to adjust to this reality, but is being compelled to do so. China's economic performance has, to say the least, been extraordinary. Actual growth during, 19, during the, period, uh, the 20 years, 1990 to 2010, has been around 9%. Projected growth for the decade, 2010 to 2030, is a little over 7%. China's actual growth rate was almost four times the world's average and far higher than that of the US and any other advanced countries. Likewise, growth projections for the advanced countries are dwarfed by China's projected growth. The Chinese economy in PPP terms is currently the second largest in the world with a GDP of well over US dollars, 11 trillion. India's growth rate is definitely lower than that of China's. Nevertheless, few can deny India's achievement during the past quarter of a century of having emerged stronger economically, increasing its GDP spectacularly from low double-digit billion US dollars to around 4 trillion US dollars today. India currently invests as much as 35% of its GDP. Its saving rate is around 31%, and consumer spending is holding up. It is also important to note, particularly for us in a, in a country like India, that apart from being the world's second fastest growing economy at present, India's emphasis has been and hopefully will remain on inclusive growth. Many millions have been lifted out of poverty, the standard of living of the poorest of the poor has manifestly improved. There has been significant empowerment of India's traditionally marginalized sections of the population. As the giant economies of China and India overtake those of other countries of Asia, Japan included, most often talked about are the different economic models they follow and which compete for space in Asia. These are the authoritarian state capitalism of the Chinese variety, 
and the Indian inclusive democratic model, which believes in a change through public debate and through a process of internal political consensus. It is thus evident that Beijing and New Delhi have vastly different approaches to economic management. The divergences are shaped by their unique histories and their distinctly political regimes. The outcome of which is the more successful model is as yet unclear. For the moment, China seems to have a, more than a head start over India. But many analysts believe that India's growth rate, which is slightly below 7% current currently, will catch up with China in the coming decades. The same analysts believe that continued accretion of economic power by China and India will by 2025 position them among the top three economies internationally, if not earlier. That's the good part of the story. Next, we come to the, what you call the Asian security syndrome. As I said, there were two Asias. This is the other Asia. And Asia, which, is, which in marked contrast, appears dysfunctional, buffeted by powerful nationalisms, and prone to irredentism. No manifest attempt has also been made by the countries of Asia to erect or create, create the kind of structures that would help maintain peace across Asia on the lines of what existed in Europe in the 19th century. The trend among Asian countries instead has been to widen or enlarge the, the divide that exists amongst them. There is a distinct tendency towards increasing their defense expenditures. Also, and despite the Asian region being the most nuclearized region of the world, almost all nuclear powers are in one way or the other nuclear powers in or off Asia. There is no attempt whatsoever to reduce the salience of nuclear weapons in Asia. One constant, as far as Asian security is concerned, is instability, uncertainty, and turmoil. There are vital differences, however, that exist on how these play, or play out in West, Central, South, Southeast, and East Asia. Across West Asia, and to some extent in, um, in South Asia and as well, what we discern is a disturbing trend of rapid growth of fundamentalist, extremist, and radicalist ideas and beliefs. A subtext of this is the growth of religious extremism. In West Asia, extremist Islam is already, already drowning the voice of moderate Islam. The Arab awakening only seems to have fueled such tendencies further. Further proof for the current turmoils in Egypt, Syria, and Yemen, where sectarian Islam is seeking ascendancy over moderate, more, the more moderate varieties of Islam. Salafists and other extremist groups are exploiting a vacuum, seeking to dominate both the religious and political discourse. While to some extent such trends are discernible in South and Southeast Asia, for the present, it is only in Pakistan and Bangladesh that such trends have become more apparent, with hardline Islamist groups becoming extremely active in both countries. Elsewhere in Asia, we see a widening divide between Sunni, Shia, and certain other Muslim denominations, like the Alawites, and they are becoming sharper and concerns are beginning to be voiced over the likely emergence of separate zones of Islamist influence, particularly in West Asia. Such a trend would have serious implications elsewhere in the region as well. In South Asia, the more serious threat that we face is from asymmetric warfare and terrorism. Terrorism has already a firm foothold in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the Afghan Taliban has already stepped up its violent attacks, anticipating the US exit from Afghanistan. And these are expected to expand, not only in size and intensity, but also as far as the spatial spread is concerned. 
Pakistan has so far been unable to demonstrate that it possesses the capacity to overcome a situation which exists within its boundaries, caused by a combination of state weakness on the one hand and the presence within it of myriad terrorist groups, some targeting their own institutions and many directing their attacks across the border into India. To this is a new feature that is becoming discernible, the encouragement afforded by groups in Pakistan to experiment with the concept of leaderless jihad of the Abu Musab al Suri variety. All these have grave implications as far as Indian security is concerned. Among the countries of Asia, India appears by far the most stable as of now. It does not face any existential threat, notwithstanding prevailing Pakistan-India rivalries and the long-standing dispute with China. Internal threats do exist at one level from externally sponsored terrorism and of foreign terrorists acting in concert with local terrorist modules, and at another level of ideologically motivated groups like Maoists and other left-wing extremists. Nevertheless, despite occasional blow-ups, India seems able to deal with many of these internal problems. <clears throat> Elsewhere in South Asia, however, peace and stability appears to be in serious jeopardy. Unsettled conditions exist in the Maldives, where radical Islamist elements are consolidating and appear determined to challenge the established order in that country. Nepal faces a constitutional gridlock which the forthcoming elections appear unlikely to break. Sri Lanka conference, both a political as well as a constitutional crisis. Religious polarization in Bangladesh threatens that country's secular fabric. As Myanmar seeks to break China's stranglehold, it faces fresh problems from insurgent groups within the country who have Chinese backing. Coming to Southeast and East Asia, the situation here also is far from, un uh, far from comfortable. China's dominating presence in the region and Beijing's increasing assertiveness is unsettling nations across this entire region. There are several contested claims regarding the sea, spurred by China's ever-widening maritime claims in the South China and East China seas, for which there are multiple claimants. Some of China's claims extend more than 1,000 kilometers off its southern coast. The Philippines and Vietnam contest China's claims in the South China Sea. China and Japan have a dispute over the Senkaku Dayo Islands in the East China Sea. China has not only been proactive, but also threatening in many of these instances and appears determined to assert its claim through force if need be. Of late, Japan, which had tended to be written off as a force to reckon with in East Asia due to its prolonged economic slump and its declining population, seems to have woken out of its stupor. Perhaps as a result of China's recent assertive attitude towards it, which has fueled Japanese fears that Beijing is out to reclaim its centuries-old centrality in East Asia, and also the advent of a new Prime Minister, Shinjo Abe, with his three arrows policy, the country suddenly seems to have come alive. A Japanese revival in economic terms is, of, of course, likely to be accompanied by a new wave of pan-Japanese nationalism. There's already a new emphasis on defense and security, and a return to the idea of an Indo-Pacific strategic axis that does not include China. This could have an unsettling effect across the region alongside, China's, uh, uh, alongside North Korea's saber rattling with possible unintended consequences. Another di dimension to Asian security is the maritime one. Sea, li sea lines of communication are vital for Asian nations since as much as 80 to 85% of all goods transported to and from Asia are by sea. 
For centuries, Asian states have also been vulnerable to invasion and threats via the sea. The Indian Ocean and the Indo-Pacific are hence crucial from the point of view of Asian security. The two largest Asian powers, India and China, are already conscious of this. India, as is well known, has an extensive coastline of 7,500 kilometers and an extended economic zone of over 3.5 million square kilometers. It also has significant interests in Antarctica. China is equally, if not more, dependent and vulnerable than India as far as the sea or sea lanes of con communication are concerned, for it also has to contend with additional choke points on the seas. Both countries are hence engaged in strengthening their maritime capabilities to be able to deter threats from various nation state as also non-state adversaries. Both are also developing a capability to ensure safer movement of cargo on the high seas and confront threats of piracy and other proximate dangers. India's vantage location in the Indian Ocean does give it an edge. But China is seeking to negate this by trying to rapidly build a blue water capability. China has already launched its first aircraft carrier and is building a second one. It also has an array of naval craft, including submarines. Coming to Asian rivalries, therefore, after having discussed the economics and the security scene. The Asian continent incorporates several rivalries and is prone to a variety of conflict situations. The India-Pakistan rivalry is perhaps amongst the oldest, dating back to 1947, when both countries gained independence, followed by the Sino-Indian conflict in the 60s of the last century. The rivalry between India and Pakistan endures, but in recent years, the potential for an open conflict has diminished, with Pakistan employing terrorism and asymmetric warfare as its principal instruments to put India on the defensive. Pakistan's internal situation lately also inhibits it from taking offensive action against India. For seasoned analysts, the main strategic competition in Asia and the Indo-Pacific is between China and the US. The level of the competition has been raised lately following U.S. announcement of its Asian pivot and reiteration that it is a Pacific power. The same analysts, however, that the rise of China and India as prominent economic and incidentally potential military powers and their growing rivalry has greater potential to disturb the equilibrium in Asia. In the event of a conflict between these two powers, they believe the, it has the potential to test the global order in coming decades. India and China have clearly competing priorities on most economic and strategic issues, as we've just seen, such as Asian security, regional stability in South Asia, and broader issues such as non-proliferation. China's approach is more expansive than India's and is dictated by its desire to quadruple its GDP growth by 2020 so as to achieve preeminence in the region and beyond, and also, in a sense, assert its supremacy strategically. India's priorities are more limited and restricted to sustaining its high economic growth and maintaining its strategic autonomy. There's widespread concern in Asia that China's strengthening of its military muscle is indicative of the fact that China seeks not only to become powerful economically, but is equally keen to expand its strategic footprint. China's refrain of continued competition in the military domain, successive double-digit defense budgets, recent assertion of its rights to its historic waters, that is, those waters confined with the nine dashed lines of the Chinese claim line, are all seen as clear indices of their desire to dominate their periphery. From India's viewpoint, China's active and current interest in Southern Asia, with which it shares a common border of about 7,000 kilometers. The Sino-Indian border is at about 3,500 3, kilometers, of which 2,000 has been unilaterally reduced by China, possibly to exclude JNK. 
and the importance now being attached by China to its three frontier provinces of Tibet, Xinjiang, and Yunnan raise concerns of what its real intentions are. This is shared by some of the other countries on China's southern periphery as well. An assertive China, and the case made out by its academics for Chinese exceptionalism, the string of advantages power relationships it has been building in recent years with countries well beyond its traditional spheres of influence, Sri Lanka, Mal Malaysia, Myanmar, Maldives, Pakistan, etc., as also its keenness to woo Nepal, Bhutan, and Afghanistan, apart from countries in the Indian Ocean littoral, are all pointers to China's real intent. The importance of properly understanding the Chinese mind is hence critically important. The Chinese mind tends to be eclectic, contextual, and relational, tending towards a systemic, content, systemic context in history. There is little finality attached to any of China's actions, whatever may be their public professions. <clears throat> Meantime, both India and China are engaged in increasing their military strength and capabilities. Sustained emphasis on military modernization and acquisition of new capabilities, including that of advanced jet fighters and quieter submarines, and expansion of its blue water capabilities, appear to give an impression that China has an advantage vis-a-vis -vis India. But this is hardly so. The edge, if at all, is marginal and far from decisive. The relative strengths operationally available of the PLA and the Indian land forces are roughly about the same. China has no doubt a larger number of missiles, especially ballistic missiles, some of which have nuclear warheads with ranges up to 13,000 kilometers. India's fleet of superso supersonic planes, on the other hand, including the Sukhoi 30 MKI, compares more favorably than anything the Chinese Air Force possesses at present. India is also currently engaged in a massive upgradation of its air force, and the plans to procure 126 of the latest fighter aircraft are at an advanced stage. Plans exist also for manufacturing and inducting many more Sukhoi. The Chinese Navy has made rapid strides, as I mentioned just now, including the induction of one aircraft carrier. I would think, of course, the, air chief, the naval chiefs are here, that at best, as of now, it is co-equal to India's Navy, or perhaps even less so. India's acquisition of a Duke aircraft carrier by the end of the year, together with the av availability of two nuclear power submarines and a range of naval surveillance aircraft, denotes that India's position in the Indian Ocean is not under threat at present. What is nevertheless disconcerting is that at the 18th Chinese Party Congress earlier this year, there was renewed emphasis on the use of the Chinese military to protect its overseas interests and of the centrality of maritime security in ensuring China's economic progress and national well-being. The preference given to the development of expeditionary force forces to conduct military operations in distant lands and seas should also be an aspect of concern for all of China's neighbors. To this must be added India's concerns arising from China's close support to Pakistan in strategic matters, China's willingness to take responsibility for Gwadar port, and the possibility that Gwadar might become a naval base to be jointly used by the Chinese and Pakistani navies is seen as a precursor to restrict India's options in the northwestern Indian Ocean. A graver threat to my mind is the extent of China's support to Pakistan in the area of nuclear weapons and missile technology. Such assistance threatens to take Pakistan's nuclear arsenal and delivery mechanism well beyond credible deterrence. China's assistance to Pakistan in the area of miniaturization of nuclear weapons also adds a further dimension to the nuclearization of South Asia. In conclusion, I would say it, it is hazardous to predict where Asia would be by 2030. 
or for that matter, the possible regional trajectories during the next 15 to 20 years. One thing is certain, that it would not conform to any neat logic. Providing a framework of what could happen is fraught with several pitfalls. But what is predictable is that the region would be dominated by complex calculations of strategy with overlying patterns of alignment and confrontation. China and India are in the lead for the present, but their lead over several of the other Asian powers will narrow rather than become wider. Changing calculations of key players in the region, China, India, and some of the other rising Asian powers included, will accentuate instability in the region as a, as a whole. What can also be predict predicted, and with a greater degree of certainty, is that by 2030, Asia will have surpassed the US and Europe combined in terms of global power based on GDP, population size, military spending, and technological investment. This does not, however, take into account possible fundamental shifts in the nature of power itself, which envisions that networks and coalitions will share power with established institutions in the future. Vulnerabilities of Asian nations and concomitant concerns on this account, diverging national interests and the sheer fluidity of power dynamics in Asia, the Indian Ocean Littoral and the Indo-Pacific suggest that alongside instability, West Asia, South and Southeast Asia, and East Asia will face increasing dissonance in the absence of a well-anchored regional security framework to arbitrate and mitigate regional tensions, most Asian nations will face a great deal of uncertainty. The sheer abundance of regional pluris groupings that already exist suggests that none of the major powers in Asia are willing to concede leadership to one or the other of the Asian giants, and this situation will only get further accentuated. Hence, the region's power dynamics will resemble a complex tapestry of overlapping agreements among the countries of the region for a long time to come, with a number of extra-regional powers increasingly becoming involved in the evolving dynamics of the region. Not a very satisfactory end, but nevertheless, the reality. Thank you very much.